Hi guys, welcome to episode six of The Recovery. This week I'm joined by the amazing Russell Brand. Okay, so, you know, as most people know, because if they've read your books, and a lot of people, most people have read your books, and a lot of people who haven't won't know. I mean, what was life like for you at the beginning, growing up? I come from, like, a pretty ordinary background in Greys and Essex, it's a single-parent family, only child, and... Uh, Given the context, Tony, that we're chatting about this, you know, like under the auspices of recovery, I think that the conditions uh, and uh, traits that led to chemical dependency were evident long before I drank or took drugs. The way that I ate food when I was a little kid was a bit weird. I was maybe a bit clingy with my mum. I was nervous around people, quite fearful, but then real explosions of intensity and showing off and performance and all that kind of stuff. So, like, I feel like both the positive and troubling aspects of my personality were present, you know, prior to addiction. Yeah, I mean, same with me. I mean, when I was going out, I, I, I got addicted to going to hospital because I got attention. So I would throw myself downstairs. I would fall off my skateboard. I was so, you know, they called it accident prone. I called it attention seeking. But, you know, I set fire to the house. There were so many little incidents of like, okay, I'm over here, guys. Do you get what I mean? And, and when I got that attention, that was never enough. Do you know what mm. I mean? I've been out of hospital, like, probably, like, from the age of three onwards till about, till about 11 or 12, yeah. Max. Good. Yeah, it's weird that. I also think that, like anything that's destructive like that. I mean, of course, there's the theatricality. A lot of us are show-offs, you know, in recovery, or at least have that extrovert aspect to our character. But also that odd te tendency towards self-harm. Someone told me recently in recovery, and I think all the things that I've got that are worthwhile to say about recovery, I've heard of other people and just memorised them. But someone said, like, that all the things that are present in recovery are present when you're using. They're all there but it's like they have to be flipped somehow. And even that tendency to want to destroy yourself, to want to get rid of yourself, I see that as being somehow connected to the idea that we have to overcome self-centeredness, that we have to overcome our, like you've already joked about prior to us starting recording, self-centeredness, narcissism, egotism. It's like something in us is drawn to being self-centered, but on another level, we know this ain't the answer. This ain't real. It's self-obsession constantly trying to destroy ourselves. You was bold to actually throw yourself down the stairs. I used to just lay at the bottom of them and wait for someone <laughs> to come <laughs> No, I literally, I, I would stand at the top of the stairs and if I, you know, there was other drama going on in the house, it's like my brothers, my older brothers getting attention or my mum and dad were arguing, I would literally dive from the top of the stairs to the bottom of the stairs. Like, literally, like, and not care, you know, I broke, I, I like just, I think I, I, I did my elbow in once and stuff. I was in, I remember, and there was this other time when I was on crutches for a year and a half for no reason whatsoever. I had an operation on my ankle, right? <laughs> for like literally, they cut my ankle open and I told everyone that I'd trodden on a, a piece of glass and a piece of glass was in my, in my, in my heel and I couldn't walk. And they cut my leg open, operated on me, gave me cortisone injections. I was on crutches a year and a half. There was fuck all wrong with me. Nothing wrong with me. But, you know, it was that need and that, because it was attention. I was getting, there was kind of like, uh, you know, I had a collapsed lung at the age of three and or four, I think it was. And that attention that was bestowed on me, I couldn't get enough of it. It was like the love and care. Oh, look at him, bless him. And that was kind of like the first time that I had that, you know, those obsessions to do that stuff. It was, it was insane. I mean, walking around on crutches, didn't even need them. That ain't normal, mate. I suppose there's probably a name for that sort of thing, but I've not heard much, <laughs> I've not heard much about that, like actually sort of continually injuring yourself. So, oh, was it Munchausen's or whatever? Munchausen's, yeah, but like, it wasn't because I wasn't actually injuring myself. I was one of myself done this, but the other stuff was kind of like put on because I was getting the attention. Do you get what I'm saying to you? It was kind of like, that need, that desire to, to, to want to be cared for. Yeah, I wonder what that, that well, according to 12-step recovery, the kind of recovery that I'm into, that need, that sense of longing, that kind of constant wanting 
is a need for a union with a higher power, mm -hmm. a higher purpose, a higher aspect of the self. That really makes sense to me now because I've been wanting all my life, wanting attention, wanting chocolate, wanting sex, wanting heroin, wanting alcohol, whatever it was, wanting, wanting, wanting. And it's none of the things have ever, ever worked for it, ever. It's always in the end made the situation worse than it was in the first place. And what's interesting, I think, about 12-step recovery is that it's practiced in groups. So that sort of levels you out of it because you realize everyone's basically the same as you. And the other thing is, is that you are undertake a program that is designed to deflate the ego. That's the whole function of it, to recognize that you don't just let go of alcohol or food or sexual drugs or whatever it is you're addicted to. You let go of the person that was addicted to those things. You let go of that network of beliefs that it's going to realize itself, whether it's throwing yourself downstairs or getting unnecessary operations or, in my case, self-harming or bulimia or all the other yeah. sort of addictions that I've experienced. If you don't find something that can supersede that something that's bigger than that in fact in the original establishment of 12-step programs you know the the 12-step group that was set up for people with alcohol dependency in the correspondence between bill w and carl Jung, they discuss at length that what this is is a deep longing a craving for oneness for purpose and in a way it makes sense because we come from all of us come from, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, we lived in tribal communities where we had a shared purpose, our own survival, where we revered nature as sacred, where we revered the bonds between us as sacred. I'm not suggesting there weren't brutal things about those times of hunting and gathering, but we are now dislocated from it. And I think those of us that have alcohol and addiction uh, problems or any form of addiction, I think that we're really searching, reaching for what is it, what is it, what is it? And we usually only find it when we find a group of like-minded people, when we make a commitment to help others, when we incorporate prayer and meditation and all the other things that are suggested in 12 Steps. Yeah. I mean, you know, going back to the hunting thing, you know, that, that, to a certain extent, within my addiction, that was always the case, the chasing, the wanting, always the hunt for like all mm. drugs, the best drugs. That was one thing. But also when it came to the sex stuff, you know, always voyeurism, messaging, 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 reaching out. It's still the hunting was in me to go and say to it. So when I put that stuff down, I stop that stuff. I find that freedom from it. And it's always, I feel like, you know, we're when you've got a chemical dependency issue, often yes. the moment of knowing you're going to score, that you're going to get it, is better than the actual using. Yes. Totally. Like it's just, something is rewards you for knowing that the problem is solved. It's very strange. There's yeah, more would, to it than just chemical dependency. I mean, I would, I would wait on the corner, you know, as soon as I got that in my hand, that was it. I had it, and then, then I, I would take me, it wasn't the case of running to the front, where sometimes it was, but like running to the nearest place to take it back. Towards the end, it, the, the high was getting it. Once mm. I got it, I kind of thought, fuck, now this is, I'm going to be up for five, five more days. Do you get what I mean? It was that chase was the, was, was the, the actual bit that got me high. And I mean, it, it, you know, because once I got the drugs in my hand, I kind of always knew, oh, God, here we go. We're off and running again. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I agree with you there, Tone. <laughs> that's the first. Well, um, so later on, after growing up, what what year was it you first took drugs and you first realised that the difference between partying and problem? Well, I think it was pretty quick, actually. I think it crossed over almost instantly. I didn't start drinking or taking drugs at a ridiculously young age. I was like most people, 14, 15, 16. But I remember the first time I got drunk, I drunk till I was sick and unconscious. I remember the first time I smoked uh, like it would have been hash in them days because it's not something you hear too much about anymore. Like a red, red label, black label, squidgy black, rolling it out, <laughs> all that kind of thing. In the, I mean, I don't, the children today, they don't appreciate it, Tony. It's not part of their culture. And so a like, I, shrink wrap. Oh, <laughs> the glory. Um, but like, um, like what happened, mate? was uh, um, the first time I got stoned, at, I was at uh, Italia Conti then. The first time I got stoned, it caused a big problem everywhere. Ever, the whole school knew, because I went back to school from my top half, I was lounging about. <laughs> all the lads that were a couple of years older than me that had given me my first smoke said, we've been doing this for two years, the whole time we've been here. You do it one time, and it's a problem, and there's an investigation. And much of my using was like that. Every time I did it, it sort of got out of control quite quickly. I'm, uh, look, I know that you, part of your life is, you know, like performing and parties and all of that. But I know it's sort of similar to myself. You, you know, you're either on a stage or behind decks in your case. 
But I'm not a good mixer, mate. I mean, I feel nervous a lot of the time. The only sort of groups I feel easy in, to be honest, is groups of drug addicts, alcoholics, people with mental health issues. I like it. I don't like small talk. I don't like operating at that level. It makes me nervous. It always has done. So there wasn't, yeah. So there weren't a long stage for me of like, yeah, come on, let's go. You know, like first time I went to a beefer, I got ill, got messed up on like, you know, I was smacked by then and it was sort of messy and I was around all of those environments, but I was in love with someone while I was there and like, you know, watching all that decadence and hedonism when I felt very sort of delicately and gently in love with someone was probably it's weird i feel like for all the years of drugs and alcohol i somehow missed the party it's weird no i get the same you know it's like yeah there's a really good saying that i think it would come from mark Almond actually that he said cocaine will get you ready for the party but it won't get you to the party because yeah. that whole getting ready at taking coke at home you just never leave the fucking house and you know you mm-hmm. about being shy of being not you know that misconnection i you know, I do my job. I'm, my, part of my job is being around people and to a certain extent. But you know what? I, I actually hate it. I have mm. to hand that stuff over before I go to work. I pray in the back of a taxi on the way to work because, you know, that fear is on me. That fear of judgment, being this, having to, to show pony who I am. You know, I'm more happy these days with being at home with my dog and my partner or walking in the park. But you know what? That's, that's, but that is a very small part of my life. Do you get what I mean? I wish it could be like that all the time. Work is really important to a certain extent because it, I get the other needs that I need met from that. Do you get it? So, yeah, it's interesting that you pray before it and that you see it as an extension. Well, I, speaking of myself, I'm like you. I For a while, what I did for a living, I thought was going to resolve me. That was the thing that was going to make me feel yeah. whole, complete, good enough. Like if I'm successful at this, it means I'm a good person or at least valuable or whatever. That didn't. That's not how it played out for me. It was just another sort of version of addiction in a way. Now, the work side of my life is, a, is much less significant. My life is about, you know, my kids, my partner, my my animals like living in a normal life I, I didn't know what it was to be calm and serene i'd never known it that's why these 12 step programs talk so much about serenity because i think they know we're going to come in all the time anxious or fearful or angry not able to be like you think that being calm is somehow that you're bored or that there's something wrong if you're not in the middle of an anxiety attack you know like so now with the work i, I love like for me life performance especially it's it, it's like my purpose it feels like tony you know like to be in front of a, a lot of people performing but now i really try to align that with like these people have paid money to come and see me i'm there to serve them they're not there to serve me it's not my, my job like I, I started to recognize that a lot of my nervousness and fear was because i always wanted something and if i let go of wanting anything it's like right these people can't give me anything i'm there for them i'm their servant i'm going to make yeah. them laugh hopefully i can make them feel loved and important and special and the opposite of the way this world can sometimes make you feel if i do if i can do that i pray as well like you i pray in the toilet before i get there I like you know when I get there, like I pray, like, like pray that please allow it to come through through me, allow it to come through me. Do you do this, that sort exactly, of thing at all? Exactly the same for me. I sit in the back of the taxi. I, I will, I will say the serenity prayer. Then I will, like ask for my shortcomings and my nerves to be lifted. You know, because for me, those are the two things. You know, if, when I'm nervous, I do two one, one things. I act like a cunt. And I treat people like a cunt. Do you get what I'm saying to you? Because I don't. So I ask for them to be lifted. I ask for that to be taken away. And I just ask that I can, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I centre myself because by handing it over, it's not in my head. By talking about it and getting it out there. Because if I don't do that, the whole time I, I'll see two people talking on the dance floor and I think they're talking about me. I'll see someone mm. walking off the dance floor to go to the bar or something. No, that's all to do with me and how I'm playing. Do you know what I'm saying to you? I, I just take all of that stuff on on board. And when I hand it over, I don't because it's no longer in my head. I vocalise it. And it's really important to do that stuff. It's about that connection. Yeah, the connection. I've been taught the three areas of connection is connection to a higher power, connection to yourself, connection to another addict. Like in step five, we admit it to ourselves, to another addict and to our higher power, the exact nature of our wrongs. So like, what I feel like is that, yes, I, have a, I, I try to know who I am. 
and this is again because of the steps, because I've taken an inventory of myself, because I've shared that inventory, because I've looked at the patterns that I tend to get caught up in. I've shared it with another person that's helped to re- relieve me of a lot of that shame. I've admitted it to another person so I don't feel deep down, oh, I'm dirty, I'm worthless. I've shared with them everything, you know? And then with a higher power, again, in, in the 12 step groups that we belong to, it's up to us to decide the nature of that higher power as long as it's loving and causes us to be loving in return. See, me now, like that, I know, I, I know that's my only purpose. I know that's the only thing that can make me happy. Having said that, every day I do things that are out of line with it. I'll try to, you know, like I won't be appreciative of my family or I'll think that something can happen with work. Say, like, like you, I know a lot of people that are famous or successful or whatever. And sometimes even I've done this before out loud, I'll say to them like, um, you know, because sometimes they want to talk to me about stuff that's nothing to do with work. And I'll let, like, if it's on my mind, if it's occurring to me, I'll let them know. I know that uh, you're a successful person and I know there's nothing you can give me. There's nothing you can give me. And I just want like, but there's part of me that will be affected by your power or your fame. But like yeah. the truest version of myself knows that you can't, put me in a film or do anything for me. I know that. Like I sort of say it aloud because otherwise that little, like you said, the, to take the power out of it, otherwise that little nagging things in there saying... A little bit back oh, here. Nag, it. nag, nag. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, for me, I think the people that I, I know and like people that I meet, and I, I'm never really in awe of, of anybody's fame anymore. I'm more in awe of their recovery. I'm more in awe of the fact that I think, fuck, he's got it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, or mm. certain people I've seen get clean and, and gone on to do such wondrous things, not within their career, but within their lives, had the best relationships that they could never have before. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, the stuff that's already there, but, you know, it's how they conduct themselves and how they, they uh, live their lives sober and clean. It's, it's incredible. That's what I'm in awe of more today than somebody's wealth and fame. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm just thinking, mm, okay. I know, so I, you know, the majority of the time I meet people, I think, well, I know someone more famous than you anyway. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I don't know what you're moaning about. But you know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's the recovery that I'm more in awe of when I see people and I just think, wow, they got it. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's, Rather than that's a good... A yeah. I, I do know, I do know, but like, I feel like I have to, like nowadays, when any, anything bothers me at all, like it says in step 10, like that if anything bothers me, I recognize that means I'm out of whack, I'm out of sync. So if I start yeah. thinking that a person can do something for me, or if I feel very annoyed or irritated by another person, I know that the solution to this lies in myself. That's not to say that, you know, violence and abuse from our people outside of yourself is not a possibility. Of course it is. But like 99% of the time I'm worried, it's about some configuration, some construction, some constellation in my head that's making me think I'm going to lose something or I'm not going to get what I want. I've got So now I have a process of consultation. I can talk to people with more time than me or people with a lot of time at least that like, understand the principles of this program and I can um, you know, pray and meditate and I fundamentally recognize that there's nothing to get. And like you, I am more appreciative of people that are able to just be who they are and not lose themselves in self-obsession and narcissism narcissism than people that like have been you know rewarded a lot financially or whatever but those look you know we can't blame ourselves for that stuff tony because if you think of all the things that we've been addicted to they're all things that are socially lauded they're all things that you know people telling you you're meant to be famous you're meant to get money like you get bombarded with this kind of imagery and these kind of messages yeah, totally. Also, you know, <coughs> when you when we come into recovery, we put down the drink of the drugs, and we, we literally that's what we come into. You know, suddenly these other areas start popping up, and we, you know, we find ourselves, you know, using or you know, using on food, using on sex, using on, and it, and you know, and it, it, it and it all becomes really. For me, it got really dark. In, so in recovery, you know, I got clean, put down the drink of the drugs. Wasn't doing the steps. This is the problem. I wasn't working that twelve step program. What I was doing was working Tony's program. So before, before I knew it, all hell had broken loose, and I was I was acting out on other areas, which became even a greater, far greater 
than, the, than the, the, the using of the drugs and the drink for 28 years. My addiction that I had in recovery was far, far, far more damaging. Sex was the worst. You know, just to get to that point of working the program and realising that you can actually be with one person is incredible. Do you know what I mean? Because for me, I yeah. never, ever, you know, got to that point. That it took me 12 years to get to that point. It's a lot, it can be a lot slower to deal with behavioural addictions than chemical dependency. Because if you think of some of the areas that people experience real addiction around, gambling, that's a massive billion dollar industry telling people to gamble. Yeah. Alcohol, obviously, drugs are illegal, but like with pornography, sex, food, these are things that you're bombarded with. Yeah. Also, it's not so simple as, as plain abstinence, obviously, around food and sex, because healthy, nourishing relationship with food or sex is obviously a positive thing. Yeah. Me, I thought I'd like, and also the thing is as well, is if you've got the kind of drug habit that was destroying your life and the life of people around you, which you had and I had, even though I feel like mine, you know, obviously it could have got a lot worse. And I know, know people with much worse consequences from drugs than me. When you stop doing it, people, myself included, they're just bloody glad you're not doing that anymore. So yeah. if you're like sleeping around a lot or whatever, it's, if it's not creating any obvious problems, if it's all like legit and above board, people aren't really, you know, I know you come from a, like a lifestyle where that is to, and, and a particular aspect of that lifestyle where that can be normalized promiscuity. And so did I. Promiscuity was normalized and celebrated. So like it took a long while for me to recognize that it was problematic. Mm. Like it took a long while. Like even though I suppose Posed deep down, I knew that the same problem was present, but that it weren't really what I wanted. It takes, it's not easy to see that what you really need is a spiritual experience. And I suppose a spiritual experience, we don't have to be highfalutin. It's just the sense that there's more to life than getting stuff. It doesn't benefit us to cause harm to others. And in fact, we should be of service to others. In addition to that, I would suggest that part, a big part of my life has become, and I say, you know, like meditation and prayer. Because I suppose when you're on your own meditating, for the like, only first time in my life, I'm not engaged with either a substance or another person or someone else's approval or whatever. I'm truly alone investigating the deeper nature of my awareness, of my consciousness itself. Who is beyond that? You know, because what is the self really, Tony? It's memories, it's impulses. Yeah. You know, a, const a constellation or network of behaviors and ideas and beliefs and obviously cellular patterns. And I'd really believe, and so more importantly, the program tells us that through prayer and meditation, we can literally transcend that. I'm no, like, I'm no longer the person that I used to be. I am in a committed monogamous relationship where there's no skullduggery. And where when I step out of line, I'm aware of it. And what I mean by out of line is that if I talk out of turn, it's like, oh, sorry, I was a bit short there, or I was blaming you for something that's not your fault there. You know, there's no longer, I haven't in the back of my mind think, I don't in the back of my mind think, oh, I've got to find a way that I could sleep with other people. Or for me now, because, you know, my program is I don't look at pornography. Yeah. I don't objectify other people. And if I find myself doing that, I stop. So, like, you know, my program has gone from heroin and crack and promiscuity to watching what I think, uh, just watching that's where it takes place, the level of the thoughts, you know. And I'm still, like, a long way away from perfect. And, like, um, I heard once, only the really sick people ever become saints. You know, like it's because we're so messed up. We've got to work hard. It's never going to be easy for you. It's never going to be easy for me. We've got a lot of ego, a lot of appetite, a lot of drive. So unless you really put that towards God and towards service, it's going to drag you off somewhere unpleasant. Yeah, I mean, for me today, I was literally talking about it earlier, about living clean. And for one, for it's, for the, since lockdown started, my life's got cleaner and cleaner. And I would, you know, not just clean from drinking drugs, but, you know, in every aspect of the world, my behaviours, the way I treat myself, the self-loving and, and the self-loathing has been reduced, you know, because I'm working a programme more connected than I've ever been. I've been at home with my partner. We, we've, I've connected with my partner, my partner, my, my partner's connected with his own higher Is your partner a banana? 
Yeah. Yeah. Have you married to, to a banana? Uh, sometimes I wish I had. But yeah, you know, it's like, that would be the answer to everything, wouldn't it? But you know, it's like <laughs> that, that connection has really happened during this lockdown. And, and it's not because we've, we've been stuck to it, because I'm an addict. I would make a million and one excuse to go somewhere else. It's the fact that it's taken me time out. It's given me that space to breathe and that space to connect again. And I've really connected to this program. And my life today is really clean. I'm really clean. I, I don't have uh, that, that nagging head, that voice in my, in my head telling me, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to cause an argument so you can go out. All of that rubbish is gone. And it's because I'm connecting to the program more than I've ever connected before. I'm doing and the food ain't kicked in, it don't look like. It looks like you've not fallen into the biscuits and the cake. You've not put any weight on. But as a real quick question of where your recovery is, is during this conversation, are you looking at the big screen of me or the little screen of you in well, the corner? Looking, we're both together. We've got like, two, two screens together on this one. So I'm actually looking Who's getting the most eye, who's getting the most eye contact? I, you are. I've like been like, there's big times when I've like switched over and thought, look a little bit pale <laughs> today. But of course, because that's the way it's always going to be. Do you get what I mean? I'm not perfect. Do you get what I mean? I'd rather look at myself than look at you. To and then when, when I'm, you know, when it take, comes to looking at myself properly, I won't look at myself. I don't want to look at my behaviours. But this programme's taught me to, it's okay to sit with who I am today. Do you get what I mean? I, you know, don't get me wrong, instead of those mornings where I wake up and think, oh, you look really old, you feel, I feel really fat, uh, you know, my, uh, my world's got really small, my career's over. I have all of that stuff come on me. But it's only on me as, as, as short obsession. It's not on me for the whole day. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've, I've learned the tools to deal with that stuff now. And, you know, I've, I've only recently started doing self-affirmation. I've only started recently looking at childhood trauma. That's, that's, I've carried that stuff all my life, and that's kind of given me, you know, a, a, a reasoning to be the way I have been with myself. The self-loathing, you know, the, the self-harming self of sleeping around and all those behaviours. And I've just mm. been looking at that trauma. It's been amazing. Just, and that, you know, literally, and I thought to myself, why have we never looked at it before? Because I wasn't ready before. And now I'm in a place... Well, what would you do with that? How does that work, all that trauma, childhood trauma stuff and affirmation stuff? What is it? What do you have to do? Well, basically, it's just that, you know, there's, it, there's so many different levels to it. So, it, you know, have you, have you, ever, have you ever read uh, Out of the Shadow? No, is that like Peer Melody? or? No, so it's a book. It's, it's, about, basically, it's about sex addiction and it's about uh, the way, you know, the whole obsessiveness around stuff. And, I, I, you know, I, I don't read books because I, I have ADHD and I'm dyslexic, so I, I don't have the capacity to take it in. I read it and I only remember what I read. So I've been listening to it. And, I, you know, don't get me wrong, I've actually listened to it three times now for it to sink in. But, you know, the, the, the trauma that we carry when we're a child We'll take that through with us, you know, like the self-hating. So it's about looking at that stuff. It's looking about the triangle, the drama, and, and what we latch on to. It's been amazing. It really has. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, just Because I, I got to the stage in, in recovery where, oh, you can't tell me nothing. You know what I mean? That ego took over again. The fear was there. You know, I had sponsors that I would be like, yeah, yeah, you know, do this, do that. Well, I, you know, I wasn't doing any of it, practicing it myself. And, you know, learning and, and being in the, having the capacity to learn again, it's been incredible. I think that's mm. why I feel so good at the moment. It's because I've, I've, I started learning again. Instead of thinking I know it. Where you, where you, how have you been doing that? You've been doing Zoom meetings with a therapist, have you? And yeah. Zoom 12-step yeah. group meetings no, do meeting. and sponsoring do. people on Zoom? Totally. They've been coming here like three months about a month ago. They changed the rules so that if you're a sponsor, you could see your sponsees. So the day that happened, I had them all around for dinner. Do you know what I mean? It was like because they, they were allowed to come. Uh, but you know, I've been seeing my sponsees, I've been working one to one on Zoom as a the therapist, I've been taking meetings every day, I've been going to other meetings, I've been going to other fellowships. Because you know, before I believed that I could do it all in here and I can't because that was an excuse. Mm. No, I was hiding behind my program and you know what it's about opening that program and taking on other suggestions from people that had the same problem as me but have overcome that problem or have dealt with that problem in a better way than I do 
It's been amazing. Yeah, well done. It sounds like you're doing really, really well. You look well and you're not too crazy and you've not said anything hurtful to me yet. <laughs> Did I start off by calling you the Messiah? No, That's I'm... right. I took that as a compliment. Of course you would. No, you know, I mean, today, I mean, the biggest problem some days I have is when my battery runs out on my, on my iPhone. Do you get what I mean? That kind of, the level of it some days. And then, don't get me wrong, there'll be other days when all oh, hell breaks loose. And, you know, uh, but I had this program to back it up. I had this program to kick in and say, Tony, stop. Stop what you're doing. Do you get what I mean? And breathe. Yeah. I, I've learned how to action instead of a reaction. That's been a new one. Because I'm a really big reactor. You know, so, so I know. Said this about you and I'll be on the phone. Right. I've seen like, uh, what, what I've started to notice, you know, and I've been, doing this a while now is that as soon as i as soon as i start feeling discontent as soon as i start feeling anxious i take an action and it usually like i run a little checklist have i prayed have i meditated have i helped anybody else today and if i've not helped anybody else all day like i feel like that don't you know that used to, i used to be able to ask myself that question and the answer was always no. All I've done all day is worried about myself and thought about myself and what I wanted and what I was going to get. And this is in recovery, you know, certainly the first five, maybe even the first 10 years. Now, because like you, I sponsor a lot of people, because I've got a fair sized network, I've got groups that I regularly attend, there's people turning to me all the time. So even if I don't feel like helping other people, and a lot of the time I don't because I've still got this disease, I'm still capable of being very self-involved and self-centered. There's people ringing me up and you've got, you, I have an obligation to them. So yeah. when I'm talking to them, it makes me realize, you know, that everyone feels the same things I feel. People feel like they're dirty and that they're not good enough and that they're worthless. And if people really knew them through they were, they wouldn't love them. And I get, I get to sort of point out to them the nature of change because I know their stories, because I've usually done steps four and five with them, the inventory and sharing steps, I, I know a lot about where they come from and what they've been through. People that have, as you say, Tony, experienced extreme trauma. People that have been institutionalized, either mental institutions or jails, able to talk to them about the conditions and circumstances that led them to be in that position and that that's not where they are anymore and that they can make a difference. I can, I'm able, because of the tools this program has given me, to spot people's habits, tendencies, like people, some people fall right into self-pity and you deal with them a certain way. You go, now watch out now, you're well into the old self-pity or emphasizing the melancholy aspect of this and inflating it. Other people, Tony, it's the anger. They're looking for it, always looking. I've got a couple of sponsors that love a fight and like them, like I'm always <laughs> having to go, okay, mate. Then you have to handle them with care. Like it's like a bomb disposal expert. Yeah. All right, mate, okay. You have to talk to them very gently. But with all of them, all of the men and women that I've known in recovery, people want to feel heard. They want to know there's a way back. That's why the more time I've spent in this program, the more I've recognized it's a spiritual solution. And what I mean by that, as well as the kindness and compassion and caring about others, that's necessary. There does, for me, need to be prayer and meditation. There does need to be an investigation into what I mean about God, it, 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 by God, and in a sacredness, meaning that life's not just I'm going to get this, I'm going to get that, that there are beautiful connections that can occur between people. Like 12-step recovery in particular came about as a result of the connection between people, people helping one another and learning to recognize that even though we have different uh, backgrounds and persuasions and ethnicities and sexes and genders and all sorts of differences as a result of culture, sociology, nationality, whatever, at the core of it, the same way as that we have the same organs as one another we have the same problems as one another and i really believe that through this kind of like this kind of communication and connection i believe as long as practiced in conjunction with steps it it guides you to the place that we were looking for originally like you know when i wanted to get off my head or out of my face or destroy myself there's a clues in that language i wanted to destroy myself even then i knew i need to get beyond this also when i was a drug addict i was dedicated i would turn up wherever i was told to turn up by a drug dealer and if they weren't there i'll wait 
until they are there. And if what they sell me is of low quality, I will have faith that next time it will be better Always. and I'll go back there Always. again. Always. No questions asked. Straight putting things it's taken from their mouth into my mouth. Big yeah. time. <laughs> Big time. Yeah, oh dear. Always. Six o'clock in the morning, you know for well you're going to get served chalk. You don't care. I know he's <laughs> I'll have it anyway just because I've, I've, I've been calling him for three hours. He's made me wait for it. On that, <laughs> I'll get it and I'll get it home and I'll still be disappointed, but I'll still call him again tomorrow at 6 a.m. Do you know what I mean? It's absolutely insane. We take on that stuff, but yeah, when we come into recovery, someone tells us do this, do this, do that. Unless we have the gift of desperation, we ain't going to do any of it. Do you get what I mean? Amazing. Use that gift of desperation. Listen. Most of us have um, no faith in authority, no trust or respect for authority, don't like schools, don't like the police, don't like all of those kind of things. And th this uh, around people in 12-step groups is the only time where I've met people that have got the authority of ha having got themselves clean, like you were saying earlier, that live in a way that you can respect. And that I'm willing to listen to. People that have found that delicate blend of sort of talking to you with knowledge by talking to you talking to me with compassion not patronizing me or dismissing me but also not letting me manipulate them or walk all over because they know the coup they know the tricks and yeah. the moves you know mm. well, um so if someone's watching obviously people will be watching this for the first time that think i hope so tony i've got no, all this trouble they will you, they exposing will. our friendship you know what I mean? Bringing it to, bringing it out there, putting it out there. But you know, what, what, you know, the, that that question. What would you, if someone's watching this and they think, "Oh, my drug, my problem's not not that bad right now," you know, you know, what advice would you say to somebody's mother, someone who thinks, "Oh, my son needs help," or "I need help," or any of those things? It's a really difficult question to always ask. And so, because most people go, "Oh, well, go straight to a meeting." You get what I mean? And that's that's not the story. What I love about recovery is that it assumes that we can be happy. So a lot of spiritual ideas are founded on suffering. Like our life is suffering, life shit, then you die type stuff. You know, yeah. like your life is meant to be difficult. When recovery, it talks about happiness, joy and freedom. It took, the reason that we take step one is because we admit there's a problem. And admit, in, in admitting that we've got a problem, that our lives have become unmanageable, that we're, pow we're powerless over our drug or behavior of choice, what's there is the sort of like, for me, that press is sort of stop on the situation. The second step came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. I like the idea that there's somewhere for us to go. Yeah. yeah, I like the idea that you like what I'm saying, Tony, is like if you are thinking, oh, it's not that bad or, you know, I'm worried about this person. It is possible for your life to be beautiful. It is possible. Life doesn't always have to be self-hatred, self-harm, self-destruction. You can get beyond it. But somewhere in that impulse, in that behavior, there is some there is a legitimate yearning for connection. Now, the only way that I know is through. 12 steps i know there are other ways some people think that the 12 steps is pretty hardcore with all of the abstinence because some people think it's too religious but i don't see it that way as religious i see addiction as religious you're in religious as hell when you're an addict we've both just described the amount of dedication devotion that we were willing to give to drugs i know you you were like a, a monk of decadence you were devoted <laughs> to exploring that stuff as far as it could you know as far as it could be taken and like and I, and I, yeah, I went pretty far myself. And so now all I'm doing is being willing to redirect that towards the possibility that I can be beautiful, by which I mean I can be a positive impact on the life of everyone around me. I like it these days that I think, you know, like sometimes I do an online meeting and two or three people I've never met before go, oh, you've done this thing, you've done that thing, you've helped this person. Yeah. In the past, it would be like, you nicked my bike, you got off with my girlfriend. Like, like, you know, like, yeah. It will be bad things. Now, because I've done enough good stuff, because of not because of any impulse in me, but because of recognising that I can change the way that I, that certainly I can change my behaviour. And by changing my behaviour, I change the way that I think and I change the way that I feel. It's, it's, a lot of it is very counterintuitive because you have to, like, you know, the third step. The first step is we admit there's a problem. The second step, we believe the problem could be better. The third step, get ready to listen to other people. You know, think of how many people, Tony, they want help, but then they won't listen to what you're telling them. 
They want to provide the solution. They want to provide the answer. I'm not yeah. doing that. I'm not that. I agree with them people. I say, you get on your way then. Good luck. That's exactly know, like, unless what, people are I did that this listen. morning. did exactly the same thing this morning. So I was saying, oh, this is the way I am. And I said, okay, go and be the way you are. And I'll see you mm-hmm. in a month's time when you're back in the treatment centre. Because that's where it's going to take you. You wanting to be the way you are. They just... In, unless you start to listen and start to take that stuff on board, nothing's going to change. Carry on. I reckon that that provides you, that is a kind of, like, you've got to sort of let yourself die. It's a cliche. Like, you and I know a lot of people are dead as a result of this disease. And I feel like you do have to die. Like, the person I used to be, he's dead now. And I go through many deaths. The death of the drug addict and the alcoholic, the death of the sex addict, the death of the person that's obsessed with his career. All of them people are gone. A continual renewal. Ultimately, you know, prayer and meditation is talked about in our program and and, and the way you've investigated the therapeutic aspect of this, which I have to a degree, I have more, I would say, investigated more than I have therapy, investigated the spirituality. Because for me, the experience of transcendence which is a nice word saying getting out of my head or yeah. off my face that, that's what I was looking for anyway and from that I have discovered the things I was looking for in the first place and and from that I have learned that I'm not who I thought I was I thought you know the idea when I first got clean like uh, a friend of mine you'll have heard me share this in our 12 step groups Tony, a friend of mine, like passed on because he come and visited me in the yeah. treatment centre where I got clean. Oh, Russell's not drinking or using drugs no more. And this woman went, "Well, what does he do then?" Because that's all I was was just a person that drank and took drugs. I said, "I didn't have nothing else." And like, so then when, once that's gone, that's you've got to build, you've got to rediscover who you are. You've got to look at what jobs your addiction is doing for you. People don't get become drug addicts or anorexic or bulimic or gambling addicts for a laugh it's a like it's a a sincere attempt to try to solve a problem and eventually that attempted solution makes the problem a lot worse that's why you have to you know in the case of chemicals absolute abstinence one day at a time absolute abstinence one day at a time don't drink don't pick up one day at a time then from then, then you're hit with the nature of the pain. Oh my God, I'm worthless. I'm scum. Nobody loves me. I'm awful. I've got to, Jesus Christ, I've got to do something to stop me feeling like this. Whether it's sitting and watching a box set, pornography, ice cream, anything, anything to get me away from this feeling. In the end, you realise that doesn't work in the either. And but through the support of like one another, people from all different backgrounds, people of all different types of condition, we start to realise. Hold on a minute, we all. We're the same as each other. I go into 12-step groups, like, often thinking, I can't be asked with this. Fuck all these people. I don't want to listen to them. I can't. But like, something happens to me over the course of it. I start to realise, oh, they're beautiful, these people. I see the beautiful thing about them. I, I, I respect them, you know? Uh, you know, I go, I'll go to a group, and I, especially on Zoom, and I'll sit up, they'll, they're next to share, and I sit there, and I think, oh, here we go. And then they start to share, and, and you know, that that's just my shit. All of that, oh, here we go, and oh, I can't be bothered to do this today. By the end of it, I come out of that feeling so good and so good because I've listened to them. I've sat and listened to them. And, you know, I used to be a really big sharer. Every meeting I went to, I had the hand was up. I would share. I had to tell everyone what was going on for Tony. It's not like that today. I very rarely share in meetings because I, I do enough of it with my sponsees, with my, with my sponsor, mm. with my therapist, with my partner. You know, I'm there to listen majority of the time. And if, if someone says something and I think that I've got something viable to say to help them back or share back with them, then I will do it. But it's very rare that I, go, I have to go to every meeting and share because, you know, t- today I, I get more from other people's stuff than I do from me vocalizing, vocalizing my stuff. Uh, you know, that's where I'm at at the moment. I'm just feeling like I still I'm have to talk all the time. I don't want to hear other people's voices. Like I, I reckon, like you're one of the people I always fought in a twelve step groups. Like that, you're. I've been in groups where you're the leader of those groups, <laughs> uh, the, like the secretary of them groups. And I always really admired how you ran them, run them strict and properly. You know, and you wouldn't. Who would think that people coming from this background of decadence, decadence hedonism, self-destruction would become sort of quite officious? And I thought, like, I saw how aspects of your nature that would never get to be expressed 
without this context were being lived. Like, hold on a minute, Tony knows how to run things. He's got good leadership skills. Like, you know, being willing to tell people, all right, you've, you've come to the end of your time now, stop talking. That's good, that. I'm, or, I'm creating space for newcomers. You know, like, you know, like who would think that we would become people that would sit and listen and care for other people, do other people favours, genuinely put ourselves out because we have to, as they say, if it's not inconvenient, then it isn't service. Genuinely willing to inconvenience ourselves for other people to become sort of members of a community. But for me, I had to learn to become a member of a community in a community of misfits and freaks and fuck ups because yeah. I'm one. It's like a circus on most days. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I mean? They can't. You know, some days I can be the, uh, the the clown at the circus. Other days I can be the ringleader. And other days I can be the elephant. Do you get what I mean? That's kind of like mm -hmm. where we're at. And, you know, recovery is an amazing thing. It really is. It's kind of like I came in to get drink, free of drink and drugs. And then where it's taken me over 13 and a half years, it's this point of, of understanding who I am again. Do you know what I mean? Because I, I kind of thought I knew who I was before I took drugs. So I was too young to know who I was. You know, yeah. now I'm starting to learn who I am. And I'm actually, you know what? A year ago or two years ago, I would have said, oh, I'm not sure if I like who I am. Today, I love who I am. And that's because of this program. Do you know what I mean? It's like what you yeah. said earlier when people would share in a meeting and they would say, well, well, all the good things you've done. I used to run a mile from that. If you told me you loved me, I would be off. You told me you hate you hate. You hated me or you had a, a problem with me. I'll take you on holiday. That's how it was. <laughs> today, it's kind of like, you know, today, I'm all right when people say that stuff to me. I used to cringe when someone would say, oh, you know what, you did this and you're amazing. I'd be like, whoa. Today, I'm like, thank you very much. You know, it's, I'm, I'm, it, I'm, I'm open to that love again, which is mm. incredible. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like, I think that someone told me that the word recovery means you recover the person you intended to be, that there was something in you when you're a little kid or maybe even before that that's trying to realise itself, which we would recognise in nature. You recognise that a seed or a sapling will grow into a tree if it gets the right conditions of nurture. But in a human being, you think, no, there is no destiny, there is no fate. But I feel like the recovery guides us back it's like all right you've been traumatized you know because Gabor Mate says he never met an addict that's not been traumatized or experienced some kind of trauma or abuse in childhood like like you've, you've gone through that and now this is your journey back home this is your journey to recovering the person you were intended to be I like that I like that all of these things that are dark and destructive causing harm to yourself and the people that love you can be alchemized into something positive one of my great memories of uh, our time in recovery is when we got involved in the organization of a large event for uh, one of the 12-step groups and other members that were professional entertainers <laughs> did, contributed and we had a big theater and i think you hosted it and i appeared yeah. at it and another member who's like a famous performer like and it was only for people in one of these particular twelve step groups and it it raised the roof, man. Someone got had a recording of it on a dictaphone. Like someone like goes, I was there, I was recording it, even though of course no one was meant to be recording it. <laughs> it was like amazing. I remember like I remember that night the spit like because the level of jokes you can do in a room full of people where you know everyone in that room's an addict, that everyone's experienced no, what like. I, oh, I was the brunt of most of those jokes. <laughs> yeah, I, I I felt like I was able to vent and release a decade's <laughs> worth of things that I'd not had the confidence to say. <laughs> you got me, but you know, that, but that was it. You know, all of those misfits in the in the Queen's Theatre where Harry Potter is in in in, in a mm. Cambridge Circus. We filled that theatre, and it, and it was just it was incredible to see because you know it's all the different people from walks of life, all of the performers. There was no ego as such. Well, there probably was one. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it was kind of just, it was just, it was magical because it, it, it was like all the jigsaw pieces had come together. Do you know oh, what I mean? Is, is yeah, it? I thought it was brilliant. I feel like, I feel like everyone should have recovery. If you look at what's going on in the world now, it's like the world needs to wake up to the fact that we've been living in a cycle, a mentality of addiction, mm -hmm. a mentality that's built on the pain, oppression and suffering of 
other people, whether that's on a racial, gender, sex, there are all sorts of forms of discrimination and inequality. And for me, recovery is on an individual level, awakening to the reality of who you are and then trying to become who you were intended to be. And I think that can happen for whole societies, whole cultures. We can experience awakening. I think everyone should have a go. I love that. And you know what, Russell? Oh, I love that, that you, the fact that your journey, I've known your journey, I've been through it, some parts of it with you. And the person you are today to the person you were five years ago is remarkable. The fact that yeah. you, you've got these kids, you know, you're, you, you're, with, your, you're with your partner, it's, and you, you know, dog walking is the biggest part of your day. It's incredible. It's fucking incredible. And I love it. The fact that you have that, it, that you found that peace. Do you go on saying to and that is recovery. And I love what you just said, and I, I think you know you summed up recovery for me today. You really have, and I love and respect you very much. I'm only ever going to say that once. Thank you. It's recorded though. I'm going to have that as my ringtone, and I'm going to get people to ring me in front of you. <laughs> it's true though. I do love and respect you, and I always have done. And you know what you do for not only. The recovery community, but the world, it, when you bring in that stuff to to people and and and, and giving it to them on, on a plate is amazing. And you need to keep keep doing what you're doing, man. Thanks, Tony. Well, I love and respect you as well, and I'm really glad that you are bringing your voice to people that need to hear it in your unique style, your brilliant communicative skills with that hard edge that people often need. You know, I used to say before, some people need meetings, some people need beatings. <laughs> and it's always stuck, you know what I mean? And I think most people need meetings to, in this day and age. The beatings need to stop. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> love you, man. Big love. Love you, Tony. Cheers, man. Thank God you. bless. Cheers. Hi, guys. Thanks for watching. If you want to see more, subscribe down below.